So I'm talking about the eighth house and the darker side of life. That includes murder, sadism, penetrating, mystical insights, all the deep stuff. I'm going to really break it down in this video. So we're all here to know the true nature of our self beyond this lifetime, this body, and that means, yes, facing death. Just talking about death and the fact that one day we're all going to die is terrifying. Yet we all have to face that. This terror and sort of irrational fear is the eighth house and it's in many ways the place where we can be the most triggered, the most irrational, the most um, you know destructive. It's the source of our destruction, even the source of things like murder. When people are murderers and killers, many times if not all the time there's a quality or there's a strong eighth house quality and I want you to understand why because the fear of death is really what arrives in our mind as a loss of control and when someone let's say let's say like a serial killer murderer one who is pathological like even to rape and torture and and get off on that domination psychologically the main thing they're doing is it's this very pathological control over death instead of being terrified by their fear of death they control and capture the moment of someone else's death and in some demented twisted psychological way are the you know in some ways trying to transcend their own death their own fear of death their own terror brings out this need for control if you've ever read you know profiles especially of serial killers who are very methodical in what they do they strategize they stalk their they have a ritual, they all have an MO, they have a, again, a, a structure to the activity, to the event, to the, um, you know, to the episode. Sometimes it leads to even things like a, like a sexual, you know, gratification, where they, after they kill the person, they they like pleasure themselves or, or of course there's the rape torture I know this is dark stuff but it happens in life and if we're going to understand the deeper darker parts of our own psyche we have to understand what something that demented and diabolical has to do with the part of our own psyche just because we don't act upon it that way doesn't mean it isn't there as a seed principle and the seed principle and the reason it's related to the eighth house is this quality of control. Everybody at one point in their life has thought about killing someone. I'm not saying we've thought about it like we're going to actually do it. And we don't do it because we have morality and we have, you know, compassion. We also have a fear of consequences. If there were no consequences and we could get away with it, what would we do? Again, this is also part of the eighth house as well. This control of us and needing to control ourselves, And this fear of being controlled by something like, for example, an oppressive government or a conspiratorial, you know, conspiracy theories also hang out in this eighth house realm because of this loss of control, this fear that something is going to control us. And one of the ways again the most diabolical demented way that we tr that we conquer that fear is in something even as extreme as pathological murder by trying to control and torture and 
get, you know, penetrate to the very mystery of life itself by watching the life drain out of another being. When that, that heightened moment for those who do it, when you hear them describe it, I've read interviews with, with serial killers before to, to hear what they describe, how they describe doing that, and what what's the, you know, how could they do this? It's because it's a it's like a it's literally they like have an orgasm. It's like a sexual experience. Of, you know, for some it is actually part of a sexual experience, but others, even if it's not, that it's it's they're penetrating to the very depths of the mysteries of life in this heightened way. Again, this is also why the eighth house is related to healthy ways of transcending, not getting so you know pathologized by fear and anger and frustration and turmoil and whatnot that we act in this diabolical way but instead when we have a healthy relationship with the eighth house that same seed principle that same fear of death that same fear of being dominated that same fear of losing control and again we're afraid of being dominated because at some point if if something dominates me, it could kill me. And I need to be able to survive. I'm trying to survive. And the eighth house is where we're aware of our vulnerability. We're aware that we can be controlled. We're, and we're afraid of letting someone control us. So we wind up controlling them in a, in a, in a more you know, mundane sense. The way we experience the problem of the eighth house is this Again, this vulnerability, this fear of losing control, but it's also the need to lose control, to lose the illusion of control. You're not in control. Your physical body is going to die, but you're not your physical body. You're not this organism, just like the person who thinks that this is who they are and they're actually killing another person. They are also wrong because just like it says in the Bhagavad Gita, he who, he who dies or he who kills and he who thinks is killed, both are an illusion. Because in the Bhagavad Gita, Arjuna is about to go out and kill people. And Arjuna says, I don't want to kill people. And Krishna says, You're, you don't understand. You're not the one doing it. And the people that are killed and the one who is killing, both are an illusion because that's not their true nature. So we can get so attached to our sense of separateness and another person that we lose ourselves so much in the in the game in the play of existence through the body and karma but that's just the entry point into the eighth house of our fragile psyche and those vulnerabilities and those things we can't control and it mostly revolves around other people seventh house mainly the people that we're closest to, especially like those romantic engagements, those romantic partnerships, or things where we have a lot of desires on the line, the highest desires we have with other people, where, where the desires are the most heightened, and we put the most into it, and we have the most illusion, and the most delusion about, oh, I have this person, and now I'm, going, now I'm saved because I'm in love, and da, 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 and then they let us down. And we realize we have no control over them, no control over that. That actually has more control over us than we have over ourselves. Again, the eighth house is where we become aware of that. And it terrifies us because it's like, my God, this, I'm, I'm so vulnerable in this way. All these people that I believe in or have hope in or, by the way, most people are killed by someone they know. Again, seventh house, someone they know intimately, really well. So again, eighth house is that danger, and we sense that danger of getting intimate with another person, because when we get intimate, we're vulnerable. So again, I'm talking about these extremes because you can see that same thread. This is why the eighth house, you want to understand why the eighth house is connected to all of these things, and why that's also the source of all this deep mystical knowledge, this deep metaphysical knowledge. You can take that same fear and vulnerability and terror even and instead of becoming a diabolical lunatic about it and going so far as to 
get into this weird place of taking another life to assert some illusion of control, like this sort of God complex, that I'm conquering my own death by bringing it upon another, and this ecstasy, this kind of orgy of, of, of death, violence. Instead, you can have a you know, sort of orgy of joy and beauty by transforming the fear of death into the great mystical power of the eighth house. And that's where that so much mystical power is in the eighth house. Most people that study astrology and study deep metaphysics have very powerful eighth houses, eighth house rulers. They might have the eighth house ruler in the first house. They might have a powerful eighth house ruler itself. Like I happen to have the eighth house ruler in the eighth house. So again, you the eighth house is very important in that fear, that terror, where we're, where we're extremely aware of being vulnerable. And so this is how the eighth house feels, this feeling of vulnerability. But what do we do about that vulnerability? Try to assert this illusion of control over situations and people that could spiral into absolute insanity? Or do we take that vulnerability as a catalyst for deeper exploration, deeper compassion, so again, this is part of what I'm going to be talking about in this astrology of crisis and redemption. I'm going to talk about this stuff full on in adult themes, in adult ways. So again, hearing someone talking about murder and all like, oh God, uh, death, uh, this is, we're going to get real. I'm real. I don't BS around this kind of stuff. These kinds of, these are real human instincts, drives, and realities. And if you're not, if you don't understand these, 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 these animalistic human energies and the whole thread from the most, you know, you know, difficult to the most redeemed, then I don't know what you're doing with astrology. You're not talking about what's alive in a person and what's alive about our karma. We're just dancing around the subject. And this is why I made this course on astrology of crisis and redemption, because most of us most astrologers, astrology students are just dancing around the subject of all of these deep, difficult energies that's in each person. This is where people's energies are unconscious, brutal, te you know, terrifying, even murderous, you know, vicious, sadistic. All of this stuff is part, you know, even the quality of being sadistic. Most people, again, I'm not trying to use the label to be mean. But just think about how much sometimes we all enjoy just punishing people. Again, we wouldn't like to think of ourselves, oh, I'm so enlightened, I would never do that. Baloney. There are times when everyone enjoys punishing somebody because of what they did to you. Oh, you did this to me. I'll do this little thing and I know it's going to hurt you. I know that, that you know, that, and, and we say that this, that, Someone deserves to be hurt. Well, you deserve to be punished because of what you did. And we enjoy it. We enjoy punishing the person. This, that's called sadistic. And that's what it is. It's when we enjoy harming someone. Again, we justify it by saying, well, you deserve it and all. That's another issue. And again, there's, there's all kinds of ways around this. But we need to understand where these things come from, what the planets are, and the houses and the astrological structures that show these things, because we need to be able to talk about it, even if we don't talk about it that way in a reading or whatever, we need to understand it. We need to understand it about ourselves. We need to understand these sadistic qualities, these, these confused qualities. Yeah, I recently talked about the 12th house and lying, why we all lie, why it can become pathological, how to understand people when they are lying. Instead of thinking like they're just a horrible, terrible person, trying to understand where it comes from, it mainly comes from being confused. Again, when some, the eighth house has a lot of that kind of sadistic punishment in it as well. Again, as a way to get control. If I just punish them a little bit, that'll keep them in line, and they deserve it anyway, and I feel good about it. You know, there's, there's this kind of justifying, again, even if we're not murdering, we're controlling and we're inflicting a little bit of control over someone and I know that I can control them by hurting them a little bit and I and I enjoy that control a little bit 
I feel good with that power that I have to be able to insult that person, or I know just where to hurt them. I know just what to say to under undercut their whatever. Again, this is also a, a, a sadistic quality of the eighth house. Again, it's not murdering people, but it's keeping people under control. I got this thing under control. I know how to control that person. And it comes back to get us. And this is the negative karma of the eighth house. Because we might, we might control the person and it might feel good in the moment to do that. Again, and satisfy a little bit of sadistic streak that we have. But the person's always going to remember now after the, you see that after someone becomes a punisher and you know that they're punishing you and you've got to watch yourself, maybe they'll keep, they can keep punishing you for a while and it works for a while, but eventually it doesn't work forever. And eventually you put up your walls around that person because they don't feel safe and they activate your eighth house of, okay, I need to, I need to protect myself. I'm vulnerable around this person. Because this person enjoys punishing me. And again, once you feel that someone is taking pleasure, not just in your pain, but in inflicting the pain, in doing something to tweak you or make you upset or something, and they kind of enjoy it and they do it to kind of keep you in line or kind of get you to do what they want you to do. Once you see someone is doing that, something dies in you, a certain level of trust, and your eighth house responds by saying, ugh. Okay, I, I better I better be careful here. So again, the deeper promise of the eighth house is rather than coming at it from that triggered emotional and reactive point of view, using the power of that 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 as a catalyzing force to have the courage to sit with our fears sit with whatever it is that triggered us that makes us feel like we need to have some control. Instead of doing that whole kind of thing, and again, it's usually with a, you know, against another person often, we take that same fear and that vulnerability and we go deeply into that. This is why, again, things like astrology and metaphysics are so useful. Um, in transforming these darker parts of our psyche. We look for a deeper answer. And the deeper answer is found in all of these metaphysical, what you might say, occult practices, but things that transform that fear and that vulnerability into great strength. Because then we start to go authentically deeper than just surface behavior. When we're when we, when we aren't going deeper spiritually, then what we try to do is, is kind of throw a knife in the other person that goes deeper than what they were expecting. And we can control them from a deeper level, but that's a, that's a, that's a poor substitute for the actual promise of the eighth house. So again, in the, in the Astrology of Crisis and Redemption course, I'm going to talk about the eighth house or the eighth sign from every point of view. So again, Taurus, the eighth house is Sagittarius. I'm going to explain what are those qualities of Sagittarius that a Taurus person, that's the most terrifying for them. What is it about Sagittarius principles that are so terrifying for Taurus? For, and also, Taurus is the eighth house from Libra. So what is it about Taurus that is the most terrifying for Libra? for example. And around and round, we're going to talk about each of these things. So all of the signs are going to be talked about in many from many different directions. And so, again, this is for adults who want to learn this stuff and really understand it, want to know it about, you know, want to comprehend it on their own terms. But also, if you're doing any kind of astrology work, you're trying to understand yourself through these paradigms, you're doing readings, you're reading charts, and you don't understand this stuff, you're just kind of, again, like whistling past the graveyard because this is where all the juice is in someone's chart and in their life. This is where all the vulnerabilities, the sixth house, their enemies, their struggles, eighth house, their fears, vulnerability, control, twelfth house, confusion, deception, including lying, lying to themselves, just in some fantasy world. Again, it's not a judgment. It's 
this is a part of a person's nature and then they don't know why that area of life always seems to come out in some way they don't understand part of it is because again like with the 12th house because they're kind of in their own world the things they say in this in this world comes off as being like what what are you saying you're in your own world and then they're utterly confused they go back to there we're like oh no one understands me I'm a, everybody's misunderstanding and again so awakening that confused part of their mind the 12th house eighth house this fear and vulnerability and again when there's when there's these planets in the eighth house again it can lead to great mystical insight but it can also be difficult with other people in their life like partners and whatnot because they're they could be have a lot of controlling energy and fearful energy and not understand why people are always wary of them why aren't there why isn't their bond and their intimacy so deep and things like this so I'm going to talk about other houses as well especially the third and the eleventh house also because they're they are also two difficult houses but this is a great opportunity to really learn about these things and with a lot of richness and again in an astrological way specifically the signs in the houses but also just about life in life in general and we're going to be looking into the great you know from from the great texts to really understand what the texts say and why they say that so go ahead and register for that and I look forward to seeing you either in real time or or in the recorded version if you're seeing this after the class was 